right, you're a developer and you're wondering where is the goodness for me? I heard about Bedrock, Amazon Q, all of this business level conversation from the show floor of AWS reInvent during the keynote. Well, I have with me Usman Khalid, director of AWS Lambda at AWS, and I'm your host, Keith Townsend, for this special 6-5 on the road. Usman, welcome back to the program. Thank you so much for having me back, Keith. You know what? We're at AWS reInvent 2024 here in Las Vegas with 60,000 of our favorite friends talking about innovation around generative AI, but I'm more interested in the, I've talked to another analyst, he said, Keith, AWS is back, baby. It's, 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 it's got its mojo back, talking about traditional challenges with Gen AI mixed in. Talk to me about your journey with AWS. So I started actually 11 years ago uh, on the auto-scaling team. And it's funny enough, and it's Lambda's 10-year anniversary, this reinvent as well, we launched it in 2014. Uh, Lambda started, and it's, it's actually a very public story about our architecture. We started by launching Lambda Functional on EC2 instances, which were actually provisioned by an auto scaling group. And so suddenly, I, I, I come back from reInvent 2014, and, and I see a large spike of instance launches happening in, uh, through my service, and I'm like, what's going on? And it's Lambda. <laughs> and it was actually super exciting. It was operationally super challenging. We certainly see the, our, our every week, every day, our, we see the load increasing in our service. It was also a very exciting time to kind of see the product grow uh, that many and so quickly, and the, just to actually see the, the, the hearts and mind it captured with the, with the customers so quickly simply because developers love the simplicity and they love the fact that they could really get a great experience, only write the code that matters. And obviously it's grown a lot in the last 10 years as well. And I've joined the team since last year as well. And so, but, I, but I'm, I've always been excited about it. Back in my early auto scaling days, we talked about how the cloud was still fresh and new and it would, you know, you now you don't have to get your exact number of servers that you need to provision in your data centers. You can just let auto scaling take care of it. Um, and let the best ideas win. But with Lambda, that's, you don't even have to think about any servers whatsoever and how many, or how many you need to provision. So it was just the next level of taking an idea to production the fastest way possible. That's what we thought about Lambda 10 years ago. That's what we think about Lambda 10 years later. Yeah, so AWS, all about the builder's journey, helping builders move closer to the business challenge versus focusing on the infrastructure, Lambda, critical part of that. It is the birth home of the term serverless. What are some of the more exciting announcements from this week's show? Oh, for sure. Um, so look, we're, as I said, we're, we're, you can think about servers, how old servers are, probably 40 years, I would say, give or take. So serverless is only 10 years old. So it's not, a, it's not actually a particularly old technology. It's still very much in, in, in ascendancy phase right now. And obviously, we're not done with servers either. Um, so just recently, uh, we launched uh, capabilities like Snapstart for Python and .NET. This this is uh, you know unheard of sci-fi stuff. You know even ten years ago, where we are able to snapshot a customer's code just as an initialization part of the customer's code. And so the next time we need to run a function or run an execution or a new execution, we are able to just start that so much faster. So in some of our testing, for example, with some of the Gen AI app applications using Langchain, uh, so Python and Lambda. Uh, we see cold starts go from five seconds to under a second, almost a seven times improvement in cold start experience. And that just means that these future, these exciting new applications customers are building are just that much more performant. Like their end users are getting a great experience. And all they had to do was turn on a flag on their function. They don't have to re-architect their application. They don't, and it's certainly seven times faster. Um, we've also been really focusing on, on what I call the inner loop. The inner loop of building an application is like testing, debugging, deploying. Um, this is not, you know, there's the outer loop as well where you have to think about operationalizing it. You got to think about metrics and utilization and CI, CD and all these other things. But the, we've been really focusing on getting the inner loop really, really awesome. And so uh, we did a couple of launches just before reInvent. Uh, first, we put the Visual Studio Code, which is the IDE of choice. This is the fastest growing IDE in the market. We put that in our console. So even when the first time a developer is trying to experience Lambda, they see a familiar home to start with. 
and we've, we've done a really amazing set of integrations on the in the ID itself, and it's running on your laptop or our, our developer's desktop, so they can remotely uh, and locally debug and test their function. They can install Amazon Q for developers and get great suggestions while they're typing up the code. That ex further accelerates the code, even the code that they have to write. Um, and we built a native like logging experience there as well, where they can just see what the function logs are, all in, all in their ID, never have to even leave the ID. So even though you're programming without a server, you're getting that experience of developing code like you're used to with developing code. Yeah, it's really a cultural shift from an observability perspective, from a, a application architecture perspective to learn not just the technical challenge of, challenges of coding without worrying about the infrastructure, but troubleshooting, observing, and improving application performance. There's a lot to unpack in your last set of statements. And, but one of the things I want to focus on is that you're reducing the friction associated with writing code. I have a business challenge. I want the logic to solve that challenge. I write that code. Javon's paradox, right? The easier you make something, the more you're going to do it. So the more code you write, which is not always a great thing. How does Amazon help reduce some of the code that developers have to write? No, absolutely. So, I mean, really, at the end of the day, as I said, going back to our vision and our, our our mission in this, and for AWS and for developers, is really be the fastest way to take ideas to production. And like, the more code you write, I mean, I, I hate to use this term, but it is true. Like, code is a liability over time, right? It might, it might feel exciting to when you're writing a opening a fresh file and typing code in it. But someone has got to maintain it, patch it, and run it for you. And so the way Lambda does it uh, to helps accelerate, firstly, is that we have about 220 integrations uh, with across AWS services and third-party uh, third SaaS providers built in. So a, a ton of code that customers are writing or developers are writing today are is, is really around taking different systems and plugging them together. And so we make that super easy right, right out of the path. So you're not writing any integration code, you're not managing any integration code, you're not scaling any integration code. That just works out of the box. Uh, and for instance, just three days ago, we launched a, a new enhanced integration with Kafka, where you are now able to run really high throughput uh, Kafka workloads, uh, which are SLA bound, uh, with a new provision polar, where we are, we are scaling that integration for you 10x faster than the previous uh, model. So, for example, the integration part is just taken out of the out of the picture because you're not writing that code as well. Um, similarly, anything related to patching or anything related to uh, resiliency, the, the type of code you have to think about, well, what happens if my server dies, or all of these things are actually baked into our programming model. We are customers never have to think about patching. They never think about like downtime or architect their code for downtime, because the act of using the Lambda's programming model, our invoke model just assumes you, your, your function can never run more than 15 minutes. You can, there is no server. It's just going to, everything is ephemeral. So a lot of the, 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 the problems of, you know, securing a product or, or patching the product, they, these burdens after the code is written are all actually taken off your plate as well. So even, even though I say code is a liability, code written in Lambda is a much, much smaller liability because your team is not held back. Your developers are not like, as they're building new systems, they don't, they're not burdened by those systems. They keep, keep moving forward, keep creating new content for solving new business problems without slowing down. And that's one of the awesome things about building your applications on Lambda. Yeah, so you, I think you highlighted and you talked through a lot of the advantages for the developer, but I'm an ops guy. And at the end of the day, no matter how well the application is written, environments change, load changes, I'm all about the observability of the application. And before, you know, I'd measure I.O. going to the disk. I'd measure network bandwidth. I'd measure CPU utilization. These kind of low-level stats to help me understand application performance and tie that back to transactions. What does observability look like when it comes to a platform like Lambda? Great question. And, and look, uh, there's no free lunch in the world. And one of the challenges that customers get with a distributed system like Lambda where they're composing applications with different parts is the observability, exactly like you called out. 
But we also took, took this challenge head on. Like, yes, it's the nature of the application you're building, but what can we do to make it simpler for customers? So we've been doing tons of work and there's obviously more to do in, in the future as well, but just recently we launched support for application signals, uh, with CloudWatch application signals with Lambda. Um, Basically, uh, just like you talk about with your metrics being like low-level infrastructure metrics, we wanted our developers to think, our operators of Lambda functions to think about application-level metrics. So with application signals, right out of the box, they get, uh, they get, they get metrics and dashboards for application latency, application availability, request count. This is not even code that someone has to write or instrument. Like again, going back to the previous question, how it helps move customers move faster. Now you now you're not writing observability code. It comes baked in for your application itself. So you're still thinking about observability, but you're not observing the underlying infrastructure metrics. Now you're looking at your application level metrics. So application signals is, was launched a few days ago. We are super excited about it. We've got great customer feedback. But beyond that. Uh, for example, we launched the capability for live tailing your Lambda function. So now within, uh, this used to take about 20 seconds, now it takes less than five seconds after executing your functions, you're immediately seeing logs, live logs coming from the function. You're not querying anything, you're not grepping anything. They're live logs and you can actually see what's happening in your live production environment at any time. And you can run queries against that, you can, you can do all kinds of analytics from it. But more importantly, you can debug things immediately if something is wrong. And it's all integrated with application signals as well. For example, if you see a data point where there's an unavailability, you click on that graph, it will connect you all the way down to the application logs and show you, hey, this is why you have an error here or a fault here, which is incredible when you think about it. You're not debating like, hey, which server failed? you have an application specific view of your observability. So as, you know, just as the SREs are yelling at me, Keith, what about, you know, my role? What about observability? I have my security professionals yelling at me saying, look, I understand access control. I understand S3. I understand the tools that AWS has given me to secure my application, but Lambda is serverless. I can't say, you know what, this IP address can't access this IP address. How do our operators, security uh, professionals and developers coming together to think through security when they're building serverless applications? Again, a great question. Look, security is our tenant zero. When we think about the product, we think about the product features, the first thing we think about is security. That's how we've architected from the ground up. Um, from innovations like Firecracker, which are isolating, the, which are basically these micro uh, virtual machines that Lambda functions run on, which are, which give you the same isolation as a regular uh, virtual machine with none of the overhead and the really really fast performance, to security ever at, at every layer, from from using customer master keys uh, where you can encrypt what's going in and out, including your code to encryption during transit as your request is going through our system. Everything is secured and encrypted all, all along the way. Uh, and then we have a great integration with IAM as well. So if you're looking at access control, we have things like resource-based policies uh, where customers can really fine tune who can access and what the function can access itself, all governed through IAM and managed through IAM and, all, and actually secured at the organizational level as well. So um, like, Totally legitimate question, but again, from a from a and these SREs and 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 security professionals, their role still very much in the serverless land is to be, to be acting as governors and and making sure that the right permissions and the right practices are being applied. But now developers don't see it as a friction. It's actually just part and parcel of how they develop and architect their application. So it's it's actually more. Uh, what I find with customers who adopt a serverless model. They end up having these organizations where their SRE organizations, their security organizations, and programmers all having a very collaborative relationship together because it just everything is just designed to work together in, this, in these regards. So let's wrap up. You, we've talked about quick start instances. We've talked about the innovation around observability. Where is this going? Like, what haven't we talked about? So I, I think. Lambda, firstly, is not general purpose compute. Lambda is designed for very specific type of workloads, like, for example, bursty web APIs or low latency web APIs, event-driven architectures, which are highly evolutionary architectures, um, data processing or ETL type of workloads, which are like just in time as well. Like they're not always running. You just need to do something quickly, you know, scale out, spin up a supercomputer of Lambdas and spin it down within seconds. That's what the technology is designed for. 
Uh, when I look beyond and look ahead, like if, if you and you're seeing just these emerging new applications that use LLMs and are using generative AI, these applications very much fit into these mold of these three molds I described for, for for Lambda and Serverless. They're usually asynchronous by their very nature. Many Gen AI applications actually use multiple LLMs. You're not just using one model; you're using multiple models to generate a, a really refined and uh, output for your end users. And they're all asynchronous. The, 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 the models they take a request, and they're going to return or stream the, the content or values back to you. And then you're, you're, as a developer, your code has to go reason over it. Asynchronous architectures, event-driven architectures, highly scalable, uh, parallel scalable architectures are perfect fits for, for serverless and Lambda. And where I see this going is I see customers recognizing that this is absolutely the best technology when it comes to Gen AI applications, specifically around inference or actually productionizing your, your models. So I definitely see a, a big aspect there. And I, I continue to see us focus on that inner and outer loop and how do we continue to reduce that time for developers and really you know, give it even more delightful experience when, it's, when they're generating the code using, for example, things like Amazon Q all the way to when they're actually productionizing their application. How do we just help them get to production faster in terms of like metrics, alarms, observability, security, how do we get them the best recommendations automatically through Gen AI as well. So there's a couple of areas where I really see the, the next four, four or five years of serverless kind of evolving. I'm excited. There's so much to unpack here. We're talking about one small part of the AWS portfolio, so much around Bedrock, Nova, and now as we think of, of these concepts of these higher value AWS services. And we think about what we can build with a Lambda around these services in Nova and this and all of the AI coming out of AWS reInvent. We're excited. Where do you go to learn more about this? Well, you're watching 6.5 on the road. So you're at the right, you're starting at the right place. Stay tuned for more coverage from AWS reInvent 2024 here from Las Vegas, Nevada.